We are also happy to welcome students from the Orr Society today. Uh, those of you who responded quickly to the invitation, and you can tell the students in your society that academia survives and that academia survives very well in the Clendenning Library. This is, as, as most of the senior people here know, one of the great history of medicine libraries in the world. Better than Harvard, Hopkins, Stanford, or wherever. I've known Stata Norton for a long time, and I have always admired her for a variety of reasons. One is she's an excellent scholar, and the other is that she's a very nice lady. <laughs> you can have a nice conversation with, with Stata about many things. She was born in Mount Kisco, New York, educated at the University of Connecticut for a bachelor's degree, Columbia for a master's degree, and then Wisconsin for a PhD in immunology and zoology. She had some experience between the master's and uh, PhD at Welcome Lab in New York, and then came here in 1962. Her CV is very modest, as is as is Stata. Not self-serving, certainly not loaded with stuff. And I was fascinated that one of her very first papers was published in 1947 in Science. In Science. Use of Hydra for pharmacologic studies. It took me many years to get up to that level. And Stata started there and kept going higher and higher. <clears throat> I think we could describe her as a neuropharmacologist, a toxicologist, and certainly as an historian. Now, as Stata knows, we had <clears throat> Ron Stevens talk to us uh, several months ago about a 40-year view of the war on cancer. And before that, we had Kim Lewis talk about 65 years of antibiotic use with a look to the future. Stata has outflanked them both, and she's going to speak on the history of some medicinal plants from 40,000 BC to modern drugs. We will never e equal that time spent. Stata, the group is yours. <laughs> uh, thank you, Fred, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Can everyone in the back hear me? Is it clear enough? Okay. The uh, way I got started on interest in the development of drugs is, of course, you, you tend to think of drugs coming from plants. And in modern non-academic uh, medicine, of course, plants are now the thing, again, to be taking. So I got interested in how we got from plants to modern drugs, and it, for me, was an interesting historical study. And I started this after I retired, when I had a little bit more free time to spend a lot of time in Clendenning Library. And I do want to comment that you have a list of references that I'm going to talk about on the table, and every one of those books is available for you to look at in the reading room after the talk, <coughs> if you want to go in there. They're all out there for you to look at, and it's a wonderful, Clendenning has a wonderful collection. And I, I encourage any of you who have the time to, to take a look at some of those wonderful books. Now, how I actually got into the first uh, book that's listed, which uh, isn't, is, is with, written with Sam Anna a couple of years ago, Sam knew that I was writing, and I think many of you know Sam Enna here, that uh, I was writing a, these papers on the history of drugs in plants. And Sam is an expert in receptors. I mean, that's particularly the GABA receptor, which I will talk about a little. And he said, why don't we write a book? And I thought, well, gee, that's an unusual thing to do. Why not? So we started, and the book will be published in June, and that's listed in your references. And there is a preliminary copy in there if anybody wants to take a look at it. But that's the basis of why I got interested in making sure that I had a pretty broad look at where drugs came from. And I want to start with Neanderthal, which is Homo neanderthalensis, which, who lived in Eastern uh, Asia uh, around 
40,000 years ago, give or take 2,000 years. And there is a group of graves in Iraq called the Shanadar Graves. And on one of these graves, the archaeologists very carefully dissected out the grave going down, and they found a lot of pollen grains on uh, just before the actual grave itself that had been buried there. Now, these weren't plants that you would find growing together, okay? There were six different plants there as pollen grains, which can be identified, of course, from the grains as to which plant it is. And that was considered, I remember the newspapers picked it up. This was in the 90s, 1990s. And isn't that sweet? The Neanderthals put flowers on the graves. Well, they did. There's a problem with that. They aren't very pretty flowers. I mean, they're things like yarrow, which is, uh, if you know it, it's a wildflower, it's not very pretty. Another one was ephedra, which happens to have a very interesting chemical in it, but it isn't a very pretty flower. It's kind of an ugly little plant, it looks sort of like a horsetail coming up. So a pharmacologist got a look at these pollen grains and he said, hey, <coughs> wait a minute. These aren't pretty flowers. Every one of these is a medicinal plant. Now that says, if he's right, that Neanderthal was fully aware of medicinal plants. He was eating ephedra for ephedrine, which is, as most of you know, is a epinephrine type drug, CNS stimulant. It's still used in Chinese traditional medicine. It's called ma huang, and it's still used as, a, as an extract of, there are various species of ephedra. Most of them contain ephedrine, which is the active chemical. And yarrow, which I said wasn't a very pretty flower, which will, it'll grow around the roadsides. If you wander off on the roadsides, you can see it. But that is, a very old plant that's used to stop bleeding in wounds. It's an anticoagulant, stops bleeding readily. And it's so much so that we call it Achillea in the Latin name. Why do we call it Achillea? Well, it's named after Achilles because Homer wrote about it in the fall of Troy where some one of his friends got wounded with some uh, spears, I guess, and because uh, Achilles was also a understood medicine, according to the history. He got some yarrow, crumbled it up, and dropped it on the wounds and stopped the bleeding. We still, in some folk medicine, consider that it's good for wounds. So it goes, the use of medical plants goes way back. And another one I want to tell you about is Cro-Magnon. That's the first Homo sapiens. Now, he inhabited southern Europe, France, in the caves. And in one of the caves, the archaeologists have found the valerian. Well, now, valerian is, and there's a picture of valerian on the table. I put out some handouts. Sorry I don't use PowerPoint. I just, I just like talking to people and not pointing at pictures. But if you want to see a picture of Achillea, it has a nice, I'm sorry, of valerian, has a nice root. And what they found in the Cro-Magnon caves in southern France was the valerian root, dried valerian root. Now, there are a lot of interesting histories about valerian. I guess all of you remember the, the story of the Pied Piper of Hamelin? Okay, he called the rats out of Hamelin, right? was a Pied Piper, he called him out. But one person said, I think he probably used valerian root because as it dries, they say it tends to smell like cheese. And so the argument is, well, maybe all the root, the rats follow the valerian root instead of worrying about the sound of the Pied Piper. It's a little, it is true about valerian root and you can still buy it. I saw it in one of the health food stores available dried valerian root. Now, why, since Cro-Magnon, would we still be using this plant root? Well, it's a sedative. It helps you go to sleep. And people who have insomnia and need some mild, gentle, it's relatively non-toxic plant, 
take valerian to go to sleep. Okay, so let's go on a little bit. I want to talk about a few other historical things. Clendenning has a translation of the Ebers Papyrus. Now, the Ebers Papyrus is our oldest complete Materia Medica. And there's a copy of it in there translated from the Egyptian hieroglyphics. The original is in the museum in Vienna, but there is a copy here that you can go and look at. And that's full of what the Egyptians, particularly the priest physicians, because priest physician was a combination back then. We're talking about 1550 BC, which is the estimated date of that papyrus. Well, there are a lot of plants, and there are some animal parts, like ground horn. There's a sodium compound, natron, which grows, which is deposited in the Sahara Desert, and the, the Egyptians used. And they used a lot of plants, and they're in that uh, Ebers papyrus. But there's one problem. They liked, and they were very use, anxious to use myrrh, which is a gum resin that comes out of the myrrh tree. You make a little incision on the bark of the tree and out comes this gum resin hardens and protects the plant from infection. Well, as Thucydides would tell you, and as the, I'm sure the Egyptians knew, if you took that gum resin as it hardened and softened it a little bit with some fat or oil or something, you've got something that's better than Neosporin for a cut because it's antiviral, antifungal, and antibacterial all at once. And that's why, of course, the plant puts it out. I mean, you've got a, an incision in the plant. Oh, it wants to make sure nothing gets in it. So it puts out this antibiotic, and there you are. And the Egyptians knew this. There was one problem in Egypt. They didn't have any myrrh trees. So they had to get it all from Ethiopia, which had wild myrrh trees, and, which, and who realized the value of this medicine, and would sell it. Well, now, Egypt had, before Cleopatra, one woman pharaoh, Hatshepsut. The book on her is in the library, along with the Ebers Papyrus, and she was about 100 years after the Ebers Papyrus, about 1450. She became pharaoh because her husband died. He was the pharaoh, and he died, and her son was too young to take over. So temporarily, she became pharaoh. And she decided to send five Egyptian warships to Ethiopia loaded with gifts. And the Ethiopians, the natives at the time, had a choice. Give us Dig up some of your myrrh trees. They're about 10, 15 feet tall. You know, they're not huge trees. Give us some of your myrrh trees, and we'll give you the gifts, or we'll take them. <laughs> Guess what? They decided to dig them up and give them to the Egyptians and take the gold and other treasures that the Egyptians were going to give them. An early piece of what kind of diplomacy would you call it? Well, anyway, it worked. <laughs> And if you go to Egypt and go up the Nile River to Thebes, you can see the descendants of those myrrh trees still there. Oh, I want to tell you one other thing that's kind of cute, I guess, about Hatshepsut, the pharaoh, female pharaoh. When she, the picture of her that the sculptors did, she has this pharaoh's headdress on. And there are little cords that come down around, and on her chin, she has a beard obviously tied there by the cords. And apparently that was all it took, as long as she wore this little rectangular beard that the Egyptian pharaohs wore, that was okay. She was the pharaoh. Anyway, the book is in there if you with a picture of her on the cover, by the way. Well, at this point, nobody seemed to know what these plants did. They were starting to work with plants, and then you could get you get Pliny and Theophrastus. Okay, finally, Hippocrates, about 400 BC, came up with a theory. He said, I know why these plants work. In the first place, Aristotle has said there are four elements on Earth. Earth, air, fire, and water, four elements. And Hippocrates said there are four humors. 
yellow bile, black bile, phlegm, and but blood. And there are in the when these humors are in imbalance, you get a disease. Okay. Now we have four seasons: spring, summer, fall, winter. We have they are associated with four cold things: hot, cold, wet, dry. Okay. Summer hot. Spring wet. Fall. Uh, dry and, and winter cold. Okay. And we have all of these put together. So the, obviously the plants are going to reflect this hot, cold, wet, dry. And so every plant after that was sort of listed as either hot and cold, hot and wet, cold and dry, dry, and, but you can com combine them. So, and they could have degrees. A plant could be very hot, or very cold, and so on, up to four degrees of the plant. Well, that was fine, and we get through the Greek or Roman period. This is Hippocrates and Aristotle. And then we have the Dark Ages. And all of that Greek or Roman information, I think, literally got lost. And one of the interesting books in Clendenning is a copy of the Medicina Antiqua. Now, it's a little book. It's about like that. And it has only about 130 plants in it, start to finish, and not one word about why they act, only about how they act. In other words, Hippocrates was lost somewhere in the Dark Ages. And this is the, the Materia Medica for Europe until about the 16th century, when the Renaissance started. That, there, were, there are 50 extant copies or partial copies of Medicina Antiqua in the world. The one we have here is a copy of one that was published about 1225 AD. The first one is around 400 AD, shortly after the fall of the Roman Empire. And it's spread throughout Europe. It was translated in English. There's an English copy from about the 60. The one that's in here is in Latin, and it was published in 12, about 1225 A.D. in Italy. And it's got lots of pretty pictures. I mean, you want to see something pretty, you can look in there and it'll have a drawing of every one of the plants. It doesn't have very many plants. Okay, and now we get to the Renaissance. And now, of course, information just exploded. And one of the most fascinating books for me for the Renaissance is the John Gerard Herbal. And that, if you go in there and look at it, they have an original published in 1633. Uh, don't lift it. I mean, it's like this. It's got over 2,000 plants in it. Gerard must have spent a lifetime doing this book. It's even got cocoa beans from South America. You know, the cocoa tree is, doesn't exist in Europe, it exists. Whereas the Medicina Antiqua only had plants from Europe. They didn't even have myrrh, because you had to get myrrh with a ship across the Mediterranean. So that Medicina Antiqua is purely South Europe. But the Gerards, he must have spent his life finding out every bit of information. And he tells you whether every plant, he now knows Hippocrates. He tells you if every plant is hot, cold, wet, or dry, and in what degree. So if you want to know what things used to be, that's the book to look at. Well, now we've got a problem. We've got to get a little bit farther advanced than that, because that obviously is a perfectly lousy way to understand plants. In fact, if you look at the Medicina Antiqua, I can tell you one of the things that they had, since they didn't have any idea what plants did, plants could do anything, OK? Well, they have a plan in there that came from the older literature. And what they say is that if you carry a branch of it, and this happens to be marjoram, you will become invisible to a robber. <laughs> and so all you have to do if you're traveling in Dark Ages Europe and it's a dangerous spot, just carry a branch of wild marjoram. And it, marjoram grows wild in Southern Europe, by the way. To carry a branch of this in your hand, and you will not be robbed because you're invisible to a robber. Well, 
that's not what you call very helpful in how plants work in modern concepts. So along comes Robert Boyle, who wrote The Skeptical Chemist. And he said, the Aristotelians with their four elements are all wrong. And of course, that meant there was going to be a change. And in fact, there was starting to be a change in believing in Hippocrates and his four humors. And furthermore, Boyle says, the alchemists who had started to become important in Europe in terms of distilling things, and one of the things that the alchemists did is they distilled wine and got brandy. Well, the logic of that is, if you distill a plant, you're going to get a much more powerful uh, distillate. You see, it'll work better. And Paracelsus was trying this for years to get, take opium, for example, which is, everybody knew by then opium was very active. And maybe he can get it more active by distilling it. Well, it doesn't work as well with drugs as it does with brandy, okay? But there was a lot of people trying it. I mean, they weren't all trying, alchemists weren't all trying to turn lead into gold. A lot of them were trying to make better drugs. That's what they were after. Well, Boyle said, you guys are both wrong. And what is, his skeptical chemist is a dia, well, it's not a dialogue, because it's three people. He's got an alchemist, an Aristotelian, and Boyle himself under a different name. And they have a dialogue between themselves. And of course, guess who wins? Because he wrote the book. <laughs> and that really started it. There were a lot of people who were all ready to agree with him. I mean, he wasn't alone. He w and, and so for the next, oh, that was 1661, he published. At least the copy that we have is dated 1661. And it's an original. Be careful when you handle it. Um, so he. For the next hundred years, the chemists just took over. In 1813, I'm talking about, you know, 150 years later, Sir Turner isolated morphine from opium <coughs> and understood the exact formula. He knew what the formula was. I mean, that's where chemistry was in 1813. So obviously, they, were no, they knew what oxygen was. They knew nitrogen, carbon. They knew the whole thing. And the next step was to define the elements. And of course, by this time, they were pretty well defined. Mendeleev set up the periodic table, and you know, chemistry really knew where it was at that point. And then, but now what about drugs? What are drugs doing? We're still, we've got morphine, we've got all these drugs, we don't know what they're doing. Okay, so John Langley published a paper, 1905. I mean, we're getting pretty mo modern. 1905, he published a paper saying there are receptors on cells. There's a synapse, and they have a, one neuron that releases a transmitter, and a synapse, there's a cell below that has receptors on a synapse, and that's what drugs do. They get in there and act on this receptor. But there are normal receptors. And a lot of people said, well, you know, it's a neat idea, but maybe it doesn't work. And then A.J. Clark, in 1933, wrote a book, The Action of Drugs on Cells. And he confirmed everything that Langley had said, and then some. There's a copy of A.J. Clark in there that you can look at. And uh, he had this is the way they act. You've got, by now we knew what some of the transmitters were. We knew there were excitatory and inhibitory transmitters, and Clark really lays it out quantitatively. And after that, it was pretty much agreed to. I mean, by then, everybody sort of said, okay, this is the way drugs act. Now we know how they act. Now we can look for drugs that will act in the same way, or maybe we could block a receptor. Or there are other things we could do. Maybe what happens is that after the receptor, this chemical, is released from the presynaptic area into the synapse, the space, it has to get picked up again, or you wouldn't be able to move an arm repeatedly, right? OK, so it, there's a reuptake, which saves it. You don't even have to 
synthesize it, just reuptake it, get it back into the presynaptic neuron, and then you can start over again. And if you get into real trouble, we'll put in uh, a, another, the body will make another chemical that will destroy it, metabolize it, so you can get rid of it. Well, now I want to tell you something personal. This is when I got into Burroughs Welcome, which is a drug firm. They had just pub the, the big deal commercially was detubocurarine. Now, detubocurarine is, a, as you know, a muscle relaxant. And the way it relaxes muscle was known. It blocks the action of acetylcholine, which is the neurotransmitter, which is normally released from a nerve onto a muscle and this, at the receptor. Detubocurarin gets in the way, acetylcholine can't act, guess what, you're paralyzed. And Bruce Welcome at the time was making another drug called succinylcholine, which is a shorter acting version, which they made by tying two acetylcholine molecules together. So there was a lot of activity well, we also knew in those days that Hydra, which is a little jellyfish. Now, if you go down the evolutionary tree, you go down through all the vertebrates, you go down through the chordates, we have some early evolutionary resemblance to the jellyfish. Did you know that? We're, they're an offshoot. Modern jellyfish are an offshoot of the evolutionary line for the vertebrates, chordates. Well, Hydra, which is a little freshwater jellyfish, Oh, it's minuscule, a few millimeters long. But it grows in temperate regions. Now, the laboratories where I worked are right near the Bronx River in New York, which then was a nice, clear, <coughs> sparkling stream. And I thought, you know, I'll bet there's some hydra out there. So I went out, a little old bucket, and collected some. You can just pick them up off the rocks. You can see them, pick them up off the rocks, put them in the, and I brought them in. You can also buy hydra, by the way, back then from scientific supply houses. They're available commercially raised. But I brought one in, and it had really clenched, clenched right down tight, you know, because I disturbed it. I pulled it off the rock, and it was where it was resting, and it, and it was very unhappy. But I put it in some Bronx River water, put it under a dissecting scope, and put some very dilute detubocurarin in the water. And I watched it under the scope, and this little tightly coiled thing just relaxed just expanded. The tentacles came out. It looked like a little flower. I was hooked. I mean, it was completely paralyzed, and I'm sorry for the hydra, but I was hooked on pharmacology. And I, that's the paper I published in 1947. It wasn't that long after Clark had written his 1933 book, so it was a long time ago for me. But I always was fond of hydra after that. Well, so now we've got the synapse, and we've got to get some drugs. And I want to get back now to valerian, the drug that was uh, present in the Cro-Magnon cave. Now, what is it in valerian? Why can't we as pharmacologists figure out why valerian is a sedative? Well, there are problems when you work with plants. And this is true whether you go to a herbal store and buy a plant mixture of some sort or whatever. In the first place, plants don't always make the same concentration every year. Depends on climate, and there's also cultivar. There are different varieties of plants that will make different amounts. Just to give an example, the normal concentrations of opium, the, the uh, active ingredients, plural, in uh, the poppy, the opium poppy, range naturally from 4% to 20%. Now, that's a pretty wide range, depends on, on the climate, the growing conditions, you know, how well they're watered and so on, as well as the cultivar. And then if you go and buy it, depends on how well something has been handled, extracted if you have to extract it, or handled. If it's not extracted, you just have, you go buy dried valerian root. I'm sorry, you're not, unless they tell you, unless they analyze for an active ingredient, you're not gonna know how much of anything is in there but if it's not very toxic, maybe you don't have to worry. But if it is, you have to worry. Okay, so what is the active ingredient? Well, it's pretty clear that there is an active ingredient that probably is the active in valerian root. It's valerianic acid, it's called. And it, it 
is a, an agonist. It acts like acetylcholine, except it acts on the GABA receptors. Now, we have receptors that are active or inactive, okay, that will block the action of a nerve. And the GABA receptor blocks the nerves. It's our major inhibitory transmitter in our brain. So if you take the, val the valerianic acid or you take the valerian, you get a block, just like D-tubo used to block acetylcholine, it blocks GABA. And that makes you go get sleepy, because you're not as excited. You have activity. A lot of this activity that I'm going to talk about occurs with what's called the limbic system. The limbic system is a major part of your brain, uh, including hypothalamus, thalamus, hippocampus, amygdala, a whole lot of the brain, except your cerebral cortex which is where a lot of thinking goes on. Anyway, but the emotional part of your brain that really affects how you feel about things, a lot of it is called limbic system. And it, so the valerianic acid blocks GABA, reduces the amount of activity in your limbic system, and you get sleepy, which is fair enough argument. There are some other, there are always other chemicals in every plant Every plant extract is going to have a lot of chemicals, no matter how they get it, unless they really purify it chemically. So it's always a question, is that the only chemical, or are there other chemicals that interact? And that, I can't get into that, because it's just, I, I'm going to have trouble just sticking with the process of the receptors. OK, so now I want to talk about another one which is St. John's Wort. This is another old one, which has been around for centuries. And this is used not for insomnia, but for depression. And it's fairly popular as an herbal remedy for depression. Uh, I might point out that when Sam Anna and I were deciding on this book, what we did is decide to pick out 10 different herbals. Not to do an encyclopedia, just do 10 different herbals that did different things and try to explain how they act, what is probably the active ingredient, and, and let people choose for themselves as to whether or not they like herbals or not. Well, anyway, I said that one thing that can happen is you can release a neurotransmitter, and then the cell will pick it back up. There's a transporter system that reuptakes it. Well, what happens with St. John's wort, it has a chemical called hyperforin, which is about 4% of the dried leaf, you get the leaf. And that actually is a, is a unique chemical in that it blocks the reuptake of serotonin. Now, serotonin is another limbic system active transmitter. And it tends to be excitatory, arousal, and so on. It has to do with the part of the brain involved in emotion. And in fact, some people feel that if you go really exercise and you get a high from exercising, part of that's due to having released serotonin in your brain. Well, it also, if it overdoes it, maybe results in some of the problems that people have with anxiety and depression, where you, have a, you just can't relax, just really upset about things. Well, St. John's word prevents the reuptake of serotonin. So you have more serotonin. So you get more of a high as if you were exercising and doing a lot of nice things. And so you end up with more serotonin, and so you feel better. So that's one of the arguments for it being an antidepressant. Some people swear by it. There's one other thing about an antidepressant that, generally speaking, you're supposed to take it for several weeks. You know, when I said valerian, you want to go to sleep, take it a couple of hours before bedtime, and it'll make you sleepy. St. John's Wort, in order to change depression, you're supposed to take it four weeks, six weeks, or something before you've decided that it really is an herbal that's working. And as I said, I'm not going to go into any of the negatives. There are some negatives with all of these, including how well St. John's Wort really gets into your brain. But that's, that's a little more than I'm, I'm going to go into. But if it does get there and prevent the reuptake <coughs> of the serotonin, that may be the reason it's acting as an antidepressant. Now, 
Another drug I want to talk about comes out of daffodils. Now that's another old one. Daffodil is one of the Narcissus groups. Uh, and it's been around for a long time. It was used medicinally actually because it tends to upset your stomach, can actually cause vomiting if you just eat a bulb, daffodil bulb. So it's, it hasn't been very popular, but back in the days when they thought that bad humors were the cause of disease, they thought maybe if you vomited, it would help get rid of your bad humor. So they actually used to give daffodil bulb to people for that reason. I don't think it worked very well on the disease, but recently there's been another thing that's been studied in daffodil bulbs. Along with the alkaloids that cause vomiting, daffodil bulb produces a drug called galanthamine. It's a, an alkaloid and uh, it's fairly powerful. And what it does is to inhibit acetylcholine. I said if you want to prevent a drug from working, I, I mean, if you want to prevent a neurotransmitter from being destroyed, you can give something that destroys the, the metabolism, prevents the metabolism, and then you can have excess of your transmitter. Well, that's what galanthamine does. It increases the amount of acetylcholine because it inhibits acetylcholine esterase, which is the enzyme that destroys acetylcholine. Well, why does that work? Well, for one thing, acetylcholine is a major transmitter in your hippocampus, and your hippocampus is supposed to affect memory. And acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that makes a lot of the neurons in the hippocampus work, and one of the characteristics of Alzheimer's is that people have poor memory. And so guess what? They tried galanthamine in Alzheimer's patients. Not the severe ones, but the ones that were just complaining, well, like some of us do, that our memory's not as good as it used to be. Uh, anyway, galanthamine apparently has improved in some protocols individuals with mild Alzheimer's and a problem with memory. That it, and it, it's clear, you can show this repeatedly, that galanthamine inhibits acetylcholine esterase and actually probably sensitizes the receptor to acetylcholine a little bit. There's some evidence for that in rats, maybe true in humans. And so what we have is a, an alkaloid produced by daffodil bulb, which actually is thought to work to some extent in Alzheimer's. And it's still being tried, it's still being used. We're using the pure drug, by the way, they don't use daffodil bulb because I told you it's got an emetic in it and that's not exactly helpful. But it is being used for that. And I think the, mm, I guess the evidence is still out for sure on whether or not it's really going to help. But one of the problems is we don't know exactly what causes Alzheimer's and there's an argument about that too. I don't think there's any doubt that some of the hippocampal neurons are severely damaged, so increasing the acetylcholine in the neurotransmission is not a, a negative phenomenon. Okay, now I, I, I want to talk about one of the drugs that I happen to like, and that is caffeine. Now, there are two, uh, along with the, with the GABA, which is an inhibitory transmitter, the major. Adenosine is also an inhibitory transmitter in the brain. And so we have a fair number, rather selected areas of the brain. For those of you who are interested, nucleus cumbens is one of them that has adenosine as a neurotransmitter. Well, caffeine blocks the adenosine, blocks the neurotransmitter, and therefore, so you take caffeine, wakes you up because the inhibitory transmitter's been blocked. And that's pretty clear now. I think we know that's exactly what caffeine does, is to block the adenosine receptor in various areas of the brain, but anyway, particularly to increase arousal. And that's why it'll wake you up. And some people, you can't take it at night because it'll keep you from going to sleep. And there are a whole bunch of, of herbals that contain that. Mate, is one, and that's interesting because that's a holly. It has nothing to do with the cafe arabica, which is the tree that produces coffee bean. Botanically completely unrelated is mate. 
And then uh, there's another one, which is caffeine is also present in tea. Completely unrelated, that's a camellia, has nothing to do, it's kind of interesting that all these plants end up making caffeine. And oh yes, and of course the cocoa tree, which produces cocoa beans, makes caffeine, along with a couple of other alkaloids, as tea does, and as, as uh, mate does, Ilex. So it's, it's kind of interesting that we have this one plant, which is probably the most commonly consumed drug in the world. I think evidence is that more people drink caffeine in a day and therefore take a perfectly active drug than any other drug, including aspirin. So it's, but it's not only uh, relatively harmless, there's a lot of evidence coming out that it's beneficial, apart from arousal, keeping you awake instead of being sleepy, there's evidence that it's, and this is, a lot of this is, is just preliminary. Anti-cancer for certain cancers, uh, anti-diabetes uh, type 2, maybe because it affects your appetite, I don't know. And there is one study which is interesting, and that is that, because you've done quite a few studies on people who drink caffeine, that people who drink caffeine live longer. That the there's a paper out that says the mortality is, the life expectancy is longer if you drink two to four cups of, now don't drink too much, two to four cups of caffeine a day is supposed to be the, the beneficial level. And uh, so one of the drugs is, uh, the, the other possibility, and I should mention this before I give caffeine all the credit, the, when you take any of these plants, there are antioxidants in most plants. They make antioxidants which uh, prevent the production of nitric oxide and other things that are supposed to damage cells. So there always is the possibility that if you take in ground plant in any form, like coffee beans or tea, you're taking in other Ones. And with green tea, they've emphasized this, that it's anti-inflammatory green tea is supposed to be really good for you. I don't know, the evidence is not clear on a lot of this, because it's awfully hard to get good quantitative evidence. You could do it in a rat and a mouse, but it's awfully hard to do it in a human. So, but the evidence for that caffeine is harmless is pretty good. Now before I, I stop, I want to go back to one, I, I have what I think is a really nice quote from Robert Boyle, and I think it sort of exemplifies the way in which you got to be a scientist in the, in the last couple hundred years. And he was at the end of his argument where he was proposing that Hippoc Hippocrates was all wet and we really have don't have Aristotelians, four elements. We have a lot of elements. I guess we're, what are we up to, 120 or some elements now? I've lost track. And he said, and this is a direct quote, I now mean by elements, certain primitive and simple or perfectly unmingled bodies, which not being made of any other bodies or of one another, are the ingredients of which all those perfectly mixed bodies are immediately compounded and into which they are ultimately resolved. And that was the basis which I think has allowed modern drugs to develop because modern chemistry came out of that <coughs> and we now have modern drugs. And before I close, I want to mention a little bit about the future because, um, well, just as a specific example, I mentioned daffodil, the daffodil bulb. There's some evidence that lycorene, which is the emetic actually, uh, alkaloid in daffodil bulb, has some anti-cancer properties. You know, we have to go on looking at plants because they really have some marvelous machinery for making chrome. In fact, I understand that we still make morphine by extracting it from the opium poppy because although we can make it in the chemistry lab, it's much cheaper to produce it and extract it than it is to make it. So we still rely on plants for a lot of these things. Uh, then there's one other thing that I'd like to mention, and this goes back to Hydra again. You've all, of course, are 
familiar with the use of marijuana that is considered a negative because it has some very negative properties. But it allowed the discovery of what is found in the body is called the endocannabinoid system. In other words, why do we even get a reaction to any of the cannabinoids? What do they do in our brain? Well, they act on our endocannabinoid. They are a, a ligand, that is a drug, that will act on our endocannabinoid system. Well, what's that? Well, that's another one of these very old systems. It goes all the way down through the vertebrates. It's the pain-pleasure system, to put it kind of crudely. And it goes all the way down through the vertebrates, goes down through the ver birds, go down to the fish, the amphibians, and down into hydra. Hydra has the endocannabinoid system and will respond with pain to marijuana. I thought it was fascinating. Thank you very much.